Oh, hello, David. Come in. Welcome back. Okay, Annie. Um, look, thanks for making the time to meet with me this morning. Mm-hmm. I read your proposal. Yeah, look, it's just a draft. Okay? I mean, I know it seems like a big change for our business, but if we don't start taking talent management seriously, I think we'll seriously you know, regret it. You think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, look, the workshop has absolutely changed my, my view on things. Uh, it's amazing what having a few days away from the coalface, meeting people from other businesses, learning about world's best practice, um, it's, it's really alerted me to the opportunities and the threats if we don't start taking seriously the challenges of finding, developing and retaining top talent. And that's what this is going to address. Yeah, look, I mean, it's just a blueprint. I fully expect <laughs> to change it once you and I have spoken, once we've presented it to Francis uh, and the LT. I'm sure they'll have some good ideas. Yeah, I'm sure they would. Yeah, but I know it's right. I mean, Francis is always talking about how our people are our greatest asset. If we want to have the top people in the market working for the lowest cost, if we want to achieve our diversity targets and, uh, and sustain double-digit growth, then we have to act and we have to act now. Yeah, look, I hate to burst your bubble, but uh, this isn't going to fly. Sorry? Well, not now. Not in the way you've described it here. No, no, no. Look, it's just a draft. Then you better tell me how the next draft is going to be different because, <laughs> you know, I can't see it. Yeah, no, look, once I've spoken to Francis in the LT. You're not sending this to Francis. Why not? Because it was hard enough for me to get approval for you to be away from the business to attend the workshop in the first place. If our CEO sees that this is what you've come back with... Are you suggesting that I don't share these ideas at all? Might be wise. Discretion is the better part of valour. Well, I don't see what's wrong with it. Apart from the spelling mistake. Well, look, I can spell check. Yes. You didn't think about doing that before you sent it to me. Well, I was excited. I thought you would be too. By what? Well, by, by the opportunity to get line managers more engaged in the processes that support their success. Our oh, managers aren't interested in doing that. Well, how can they not be? Well, they don't see it as their job. They see it as HR's job. Yeah, but, but they're always complaining that HR can't keep up. You know, if, if it's not the quality of new placements, they're, they're, they're moaning when, when top performers leave. And your point is? Well, my, my point is that if, if we line managers can get more engaged in the processes around selecting, developing, retaining good talent... Then they won't be able to blame HR. Yeah, precisely. Well, you can't take that away from them. Sorry, David, I don't, I don't mean to be negative. You don't? No, is that the workshop? No, I don't. Is that the workshop manual? Yes, it is. Give us a look. Lord, some of this stuff. Look, uh- would it be okay if we did a bit of work on my proposal? I mean, I can always do a second draft. Is there any point? How much do we spend in you attending this program? Well, $10,000. Crikey. Well, don't tell HR. Oh, no, hang on. They're bound to find out. Okay, we'll talk about it. You take minutes. Minutes? $10,000, you take minutes. <sighs> okay, so... So, what's your, what's your greatest concern? I had no idea it cost that much. No, what's your, what's your greatest concern with my proposal? Oh, well, for one, it's the scale of what you're proposing. I mean, in case you hadn't noticed, the economic environment is still pretty rocky. Well, I mean, that's precisely the reason why we should have a talent management strategy. But then again, we have been scraping through, you know, if it ain't broke. Look, I know that we've been scraping through, but, but is that going to be sustainable? What makes you think it's not? OK, look, we... we, we um, we explored a number of case studies. But were they companies like ours? Yes, yeah, sort of. Were they Australian companies like ours? I mean, I'm not interested in what happened at Walmart or Wells Fargo or the BBC. <coughs> Look, the principles are universal. Nonsense. Okay. Our people are a unique bunch. I don't think the same principles apply. Well, they're not that special. They are a rare commodity. They're just people. With unique specifications. People don't have specifications. I want that minuted. Unique Specifications. Gosh, for goodness 
sake. They're under enormous pressure already and what you are proposing would create additional stress okay. in our managers. Okay, if we were to upgrade the performance management system. Then you're relying on IT. <laughs> Not a good idea. You don't need to minute that. <laughs> Look, surely... IT stand to benefit from You as well. think you can encourage no. IT to become more engaged in people management. Well, look, I mean, IT, it will save them, it will save everybody time in the long term. When you're measuring performance month to month, long term doesn't exist, David. All right, but short term gains can be made if we were to implement a strategy of increasing the mobility between teams. Our guys are possessive of their team members. I can't see them letting go of a good performer in the name of a talent management strategy. Look, if it's, it'll just breed resentment. If we took a whole of business approach. Oh. Oh. You're talking whole of business. Yes, of course I am. Oh, not just your silo. It won't work if it's just my silo. Oh, okay, look, there you have it. There you have it, it won't work. No, you're splashing around terms like whole of business and long term while speculating that our IT managers have the interest or capacity to understand people issues. It's just not realistic. <laughs> it's possible. The business can't change in the way that you're imagining it. I don't care what your case studies say. We've got so many cogs doing their things in a very precise rhythm. If you disrupt the rhythm with tasks and expectations that they're not engineered for, the machine will crash. Oh, look. I was so optimistic. Yes, well, you've, you've, you've got to be careful, you know, when you go on these courses. So what do I do now? Well, I don't want to be the bad guy in this, okay? I'm happy for you to think about what I've said and I'm happy for you to keep thinking about, you know, new ideas that might keep our people engaged, Just, but don't expect too much from myself and for goodness sakes, don't talk about any of this to Francis or the LT without talking to me first. I don't want anybody having a Jerry Maguire moment on my watch. Is that clear? It's clear. Good. Alrighty. While you're away, a few issues cropped up. I had to cover for you, but you know, Mary got sick. You know what it's like. So, Francis wants us to review the job descriptions for all the frontline leaders and report to the LT on any areas of overlap. Get cracking, please. The meeting is tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? I know it's tight. Okay, I'll get on with it. Good boy. Well, according to our data, many of you must have seen some genuine familiarity in that scene. What I have up on the screen there is the average for the Australasian business of all the culture data across the organisations that have used our instrument to measure their organisation's culture. For those of you that are familiar with it, you'll know immediately what that means. For those that are not, uh, I'll just give you the, the two-second version of what that round thing means. The, 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 the circumplex measures 12 styles of behaviour that cluster off into three groups, and we use the colour coding to denote those. So the blue represents constructive styles. So constructive styles are behaviours that build, that, that, that very purposefully call constructive. It's a word that we use more and more in the vernacular today. We, when we see in the paper, he or she dealt with that very constructively. And it's the notion of doing things in order to achieve a desirable outcome. But the green is the passive defensive styles. So now measuring behaviours that are essentially defensive but are passive in notion. And, and, and one of the, the things about defensive behaviours is that we produce those behaviours in order to feel safe within ourselves. But the, safe, the safety may be an illusion. So a, a, a classic illustration of passive defensive behaviour is if you're driving along a country road at night time in the dark, you of course have your headlights on, and a rabbit runs out in the middle of the road, it immediately feels threatened, makes a decision that it will stop still, in order to feel safe, and then it dies. 
That's the notion of illusionary behaviour. Instantly it makes me feel secure, but it doesn't necessarily achieve a desirable outcome at the end of it all. The red is the aggressive defensive styles. This time the rabbit would jump up on the windscreen and eat you. So still, still trying to protect itself, but now using very aggressive styles to do it. So this, this circumplex represents those three clusters and 12 styles around the cultures of the organisations that have undertaken the survey. And as you can see, the N equals is quite large. It's nearly 400,000 people. So it's got to be vaguely representative of the Australian and New Zealand market out there. The... The, the notion of organisational culture, again, one of the, the simple definitions we use is that it's how people believe they are expected to behave in order to fit in, get ahead, and at times simply survive. So it's the notion of expectation. So how do people typically feel they are expected to behave? And this is the strongest style. It's seven. So at seven o'clock, the further out from the bullseye, the stronger that particular style. So you saw in that drama the whole notion around fault finding. I mean, the, the classic one of, of finding the spelling errors in a report that somebody has written very passionately. Uh, the whole negativism, the making safe decisions, but somewhat ineffectual decisions. So typically, that scenario is being played out today, right now, in thousands of organisations around Australia and New Zealand. The second strongest style is that of avoidance, which is around shifting responsibilities which is around avoiding the possibility of being blamed. So again, you could see that coming through from the manager's uh, words and behaviour and styles within that drama. The third strongest style is at 9 o'clock. So for those that aren't familiar, sorry, avoidance is at 6. Competitive at 9 o'clock, so it's a very short-term focus. People are expected to only think about today or the very near future. It's around individualism, so something that's whole of organisation or whole of business is a complete anathema in a competitive culture. And, and this, this notion of silos, I mean, it's such a common phenomenon within organisations today. And the fourth strongest style, the ones that extend beyond that third ring out, the bolded line, that represents, if you like, an average. It's the 50th percentile for those that like the technicalities. But if it extends beyond that, it's very strong. It's, it's above a benchmark, if you like. If it's underneath it, it's rather low. And so you can see all of those four constructive styles are, in effect, beneath that benchmark. And two of the red, aggressive defensive styles, are above it, and two of the green, passive defensive styles, are above it. So the last is the conventional at four o'clock, which is around resisting new ideas, and you certainly saw that coming through in that drama, uh, and, 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 and conforming and not rocking the boat, but at the same time trying to make a good impression. So that's, that's the tragedy of the data. And I do see it as being a tragedy. Because every day people are going to work having to Experience that. And life's too damn short for that. Now you have in your bag that you were given on registration a blue booklet, the research results book. It's called the RRB this year. And everything that I'm about to, uh, to mention and talk through, including this profile, is in that book. And if you're unfamiliar with the circumplex, because you will see a few as the morning progresses, there's a little A5 card that has a circumplex with some descriptions around it that when the lights come on full, you'll be able to have a look at that and follow what the other speakers are talking about. Now, when we do these culture surveys, we have a, a, a select group, usually the top executive group, complete a, a preferred, an ideal culture. How would you like people to behave in your organisation for your organisation to function effectively? And that's the average. Just, just a tad different. Right? So what are they saying? They're saying these constructive styles. We want people to be supportive. Resolve conflicts constructively. We want people to be creative. Take on new and interesting tasks. So here you have the situation of where an individual manager comes back from a course wanting to do new and interesting things and comes smack up against the culture. The achievement at 11, so the humanistic is 1, the self-actualising is 12, the achievement at 11, set and pursue challenging tasks, and the affiliative at 2, build relationships, cooperate, etc. So there's a serious disconnect going on between desire and reality. It's what Geoffrey Pfeffer in his wonderful book called The Knowing Doing Gap. We know what we want, we simply don't do it. So I'd like to explain that disconnect for you. Now, you're no doubt groaning, saying, God, I can't read a word on that graph. I don't, I don't want you to. Don't try and read the graph. The graph is there to show you some things. So this is, this is uh, the, what we call a causal factor. It's from another survey tool 
that we use with the culture inventory, this is the organisational effectiveness inventory, and it measures what's causing the culture to be as it is. And what we see, firstly, the benchmark. So the bold line is designed to define the benchmark. And everything that is above that benchmark contributes towards constructive cultures. And everything that is below that benchmark contributes to defensive cultures, either passive or aggressive, and in turn limits the constructive culture. I mean, it's very difficult to have a constructive and a defensive culture at the same time. So you can see on the graph that the vast majority of those causal factors score well below that benchmark. So let's have a look very briefly at what's going on here. Firstly, the articulation of mission, what that data is telling us, and one of the reasons the average culture is not constructive but more passive and aggressive defensive is that we don't seem to articulate a shared philosophy typically and we don't emphasise the customer in our mission statements. The mission statements are about making lots of money or making our shareholders rich. To a customer, let me tell you, that's totally irrelevant. And the organisation only in fact exists to serve the customer. The influence, empowerment, involvement stuff is very, very low. One of the really interesting things, we're terribly democratic in this part of the world. We're all equally able to influence. We're just all able to influence bugger all. And you saw that again in the drama. The manager did not feel that she could influence those further up the organisation. When we look at the human resources systems, the training and development, the recruitment, selection... They don't seem to support constructive styles. And there are, I mean, if I had all day, there are a thousand stories I could share with you over 30 odd years of being a consultant. We have learned not to punish people in public, so that scores above the line. But we haven't learned to praise people. So we're doing one thing quite well, but the, uh, the, the flip side is not, not a happening thing. On the other hand, we've all been to goal setting courses, so the goal setting stuff's not working too badly. The job design stuff, on the other hand, Autonomy, variety, significance, identity, feedback is, as you can see, just extremely low. And that's why when people like Dan Pink write the book called Drive that talks about the need for autonomy, it becomes a New York list bestseller overnight. It's what people want because they haven't got it. We look at the communication stuff and upwards it's somewhat filtered and downward. It's, it's just facts and information. It should promote discussion. So you can see how all of these causal factors are leading to that rather defensive culture. Now, since the structures, the systems, and the job design stuff reinforce defensive norms, we look to our leaders to be perfect. And, of course, they're not, because it's very difficult to be perfect. And the leader gets caught in paradoxes, because if we look at one of the job design functions, it's called autonomy. We take all the autonomy out of jobs so that we get simplification and consistency, but we now create a job that an individual has to do that has little autonomy. But damn me, what does management expect of him or her? To use his or her initiative. It's really hard to use your initiative when you've got no autonomy. And then we look at the bases of power for those that understand this rather complex beast. The organisational bases of power don't look too bad, but the personal bases of power, the real genuine leadership stuff, does not. So all of these low causal factors contribute to that very defensive culture. So this is the same profile again with just some slightly different descriptions around those styles. And you can see how those particular descriptions played out within that drama. So what we want you to see as the morning unfolds is the systems relationship between leadership and culture. That the leadership is the way it is because of the culture within which it functions. And the culture is in turn reinforced by the way in which the leadership functions, which continues to reinforce the culture and so on and so forth. So in that drama, it's very easy to look at the female boss and say, to be very nice, not a particularly effective leader, at the other end of the scale you might say she's a right bitch. Right? But she's operating within a, within a culture a culture that demands certain behaviours of her. And if I go back to my definition of culture, the, shared, the, the, the way people believe they are expected to behave in order to fit in, get ahead, and at times simply survive, what that particular profile tells us is that this is more about survival than anything else. So people are operating on a daily basis of how do I get through today. 
the relationship with leadership. This is the average of our lifestyles inventory, the LSI. It's a very, very large data set, as you can see, 140,000 plus managers, leaders have undertaken the personal styles tool. And these are the styles that are prevailing. I mean, it's a very large data set, so it's a bit of a blob around that 50th percentile. So now the differences are quite subtle. But within an avoidance culture, the primary leadership style, managerial style, is, surprise, surprise, avoidance. Approval. Within an oppositional culture, we get the oppositional behaviours in the leaders. Within a competitive culture, we get the competitive behaviours in the leaders. Okay? So the leadership culture connection is absolute within organisations. Just some more data. Tool that we use only with top executives. So these are top executives in generally rather large organisations. It's a tool called Leadership Impact. In this case, the leaders themselves say, what behaviours do I want to promote in my people? How do I want to motivate my people to behave? And again, unsurprisingly, they say, we want people to use constructive behaviours. And it's consistent with the ideal preferred culture, so you would expect that. But then when we look at the average of how 40-odd thousand people have described those 5,000-odd top executives, hey, it's those cultural styles again. It's the conventional, it's the oppositional, it's the competitive, this time perfectionistic kicks in. And hey, there is one blue, there's humanistic encouraging, but it's somewhat overwhelmed by the others. So this relationship between culture and leadership is absolute. Now again, as part of that tool that measures the causal factors thing, when we do these surveys, it also measures outcomes of culture. So it measures what causes the culture, the other one measures the culture, and it all, but it also measures so what happens as a consequence of this culture. So again, there's the benchmark line. Everything above the line are desirable outcomes, everything below the line are undesirable outcomes. So that blue lot tells us that individuals do not clearly know what is expected of them, they're not particularly satisfied and they're not motivated, but they're going to hang around. Intention to stay is above the line. If we look at the next lot, they receive inconsistent messages regarding what is expected of them, but they report that job insecurity and stress are not issues. So you put those together, I mean you have a wonderful scenario. What is happening in those defensive cultures is that people are saying, I have no idea what the hell I'm supposed to be doing, I'm not very happy, I'm not motivated, but I'm not going anywhere. And I'm not stressed, and I feel reasonably secure in my job. That's a hell of a way to run an organisation. <laughs> but that's what's happening out there. At the team level, the teamwork and inter-unit coordination stuff ain't happening particularly well, and at the organisational level, Members report that the organisation does not adapt well to changes in its environment. Well, of course, everybody's sitting around not doing very much and not being very motivated and not being stressed and not going anywhere. Well, then, of course, the organisation cannot adapt. And they report that organisational quality is rather low. So if I was a chief executive, those last two, if nothing else, would grab my attention. And as you can see, the data set is quite, quite large. So what does a constructive culture look like? To, 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 to do this part of the presentation, I simply asked one of the folks in our Sydney office, give me the data of somebody that we've done recently that's got a constructive profile. I don't even want to know who it is. It doesn't really matter. And so here it is. This is a particular organisation's culture profile. It's an Australian one. See how the constructive styles prevail. Now have a look at the next slide. It's not a coincidence, therefore, that all the causal factors, bar one, score above that benchmark. So all of these things are functioning very well. And then when we look at it from an outcomes point of view, we see all those outcomes at the individual, group and organisational level scores well above that benchmark. So if the causal factors, if the organisation is doing things effectively, it results in a constructive culture which leads to high motivation, high satisfaction, high role clarity, low role conflict, low stress and insecurity, but importantly, high teamwork, cooperation, coordination, adaptation and organisational level quality. Oh, and this is their leadership. So again, they just give me the average of the people that have done the LSI in this organisation and this is what it looks like. So you can see the relationship between the culture and the leadership in that example is absolute. Constructive culture, constructive styles and the leaders, constructive culture, reinforcing the styles and the leaders, reinforcing the culture, etc., etc. So let's have a look and see what a constructive culture looks like. Oh, hello, Dave. 
Come in, welcome back. Annie, um, look, thanks for making the time to meet with me this morning. Well, thanks for the thought and energy you've put into this proposal. Yeah, look, I mean, it's just a draft. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know it seems like a big change for the business, <coughs> but if we don't start taking talent management seriously, I think we'll regret it. Well, you sound very certain. Oh, look, absolutely. I mean, the workshop's opened my eyes. Uh, it's amazing what having a few days away from the coalface, you know, meeting people from other businesses, um, learning about world's best practice. Uh, it, it, it's really alerted me to the opportunities and the threats if we don't start addressing the challenges of finding, developing and retaining top talent. Well, you've made a very compelling argument. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just a blueprint. Um, <coughs> I, I fully expect that we'll refine it after we've spoken and after I've presented it to Francis and the LT. I'm sure they'll have some good yeah, ideas. Yeah, I'm sure they would. Yeah, but uh, I know it's right. I, I, I see it so clearly. I mean, Francis is always saying that our people are our greatest asset. If we want to have the top people in the market for the lowest cost, uh, if we want to achieve our diversity targets and sustain double-digit growth, then we have to act, and we have to act now. Okay. Before we go into action, what's our first outcome to be achieved? One of the things that they stressed in the workshop was the importance of leadership engagement. Hence presenting this to Francis and the LT? Yeah, that's right. Look, I agree without the support of the LT this isn't going to fly. So, first outcome? Uh, okay. Um, well, I guess, I mean, it's the preparation of a compelling vision for, for talent management in our business. What do you think? Am I close? I've said you've made a compelling argument. Fundamentally, I agree that talent management could play a crucial role in business strategy mm -hmm. and I think you'll find our human resources people extremely supportive. All right. But what's the catch? Okay. To achieve the benefits you've articulated here yeah. will require shifts in perception, in capability and in behaviour. Do you think we're up for it? I do. I think it'll stretch us, but I really think that Francis and the LT are up for something this far-reaching. And, as we know, change of this magnitude is not simple. I mean, I mean, do you have time to do some work on the proposal now? Yeah, sure. I'd love to get a sense of some of the principles behind the workshop. Is that the manual? Yes, it is. Okay, can I have a look? Sure. I'm not trying to become the expert, but just good to get an idea of where you're coming from. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is good stuff. So of primary importance is the leadership buy-in. That's right. Okay, in your experience, what does our leadership buy into? Um, well, I mean, they're generally you know, very supportive of the initiatives that support our, our business strategy. And do you think you've made the links in your proposal? Yeah, well, I think so. I mean, I've, I've linked the retention of top talent to our, to our customer satisfaction and our cost reduction strategies. Well, you have in theory. Uh, and? Well, okay. Where has the link been proven in our business? Where's the evidence that the equation is valid in our culture? Yeah, no, no, I can think of two, two, okay. two instances. I mean, one where we, where we did lose a piece of the market on the back of losing a key customer manager. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I've been talking to Chloe. Uh, Chloe's one of our business analysts. Yeah, yes? that's right. Uh -huh. That's right. And, and, and her view is that it is our most stable teams that out, outperform the rest. Okay. Would you be prepared to include Chloe as an advocate on that point? Yeah, yeah, it's a great idea. Okay, that'll resonate with Nick. And as you know, Francis relies on Nick's views on strategy. But yes. let me ask you, if you're building an argument based on the benefits of retention, how do you rationalise the talent sharing? How do I rationalise it? As I understand it, we develop top talent by giving them experience across the whole business. But if we encourage our leaders to, to mentor and to coach, how are they going to feel when their people are rotated out of their teams? Are you concerned that that's going to destabilise people? Who do you think is going to be impacted most by a talent sharing program? All right, I was going to say the high potentials, but I guess, I guess it's we line managers who are going to be doing the, the coaching and the mentoring. We have to accept that people might get rotated out of our areas. It's a noble choice. Do you think we're there yet? Am I being too ambitious? Don't surrender the ambition, but it needs to be explored, that's all. Okay, so what, you're saying I've got to sell it to people? No, no, I'm not suggesting you sell anything at this stage. I'm suggesting you look critically at your framework. I can see from your workshop notes how important that is. Yeah. Do you think you've cracked it? Yeah, I'm not certain. Look, the right framework for our people, for our business, will be very specific. Yeah. Um, apart from Chloe, who else have you spoken to? 
Well, I'm talking to you. Yes, yes you are. Um, what about IT? Uh, look, I didn't want to frighten the horses until uh, we got everybody on board. Okay. I think, uh, I think our horses are a pretty stable bunch. Just confirm this for me. You'd be proposing changes to the performance management system. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I think Dennis would be more supportive if he felt that you understood what he is expected to deliver in the next 18 months. Okay. Uh, and if he understood the benefits of an integrated talent management strategy? It sounds like someone was trying to sell him something. Okay, so what are you saying? Like, don't, don't sell anything at all? Sell it to people when they have to sign off on the investment or when they have to sign on to the program. Mm -hmm. Now, look, what's our first outcome? Okay, well, first outcome is the preparation of a compelling vision. Okay, no. Um, a, a compelling business case for talent management in our organisation. Our diverse, geographically dispersed organisation. Yep. Seems like I've got more talking to do. More talking? Okay, more, more asking questions and listening. How's that sound? Well, I mean, it sounds like it's going to take a bit longer and um, I'm going to have to adjust my thinking a bit, aren't I? Look, when I read this, I thought, yes, this makes sense. It's exciting. It's great you're excited about it. I think a lot of people are going to be very excited about it. But the difference between excitement and anxiety or resentment is belief. Will this deliver on the promise? Belief is based in reality, not salesmanship. David, it's a great start. Okay? Do the work. The selling will take care of itself. Okay, so before presenting to Francis, engage with HR. Um, talk to IT. Uh, talk to the other line managers. Get their sense of what it would be like to have people rotating through the business. Um, essentially get the framework right, yes? When Francis latches onto this, it will happen. You know that. And until then, I'm going to support you, okay? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. And thank you very much. So, the leadership, culture, performance connection. As you can see, constructive behaviours in one drives constructive behaviours in the other. And when those constructive styles are allowed to grow within a constructive culture, it creates a challenging, therefore motivating, and yet satisfying environment for people to function with them. As you, as you see, I mean, the other point I'd like to make, I mean, what's uh, very nice about the drama, is that because so many organisations have these oppositional styles, the red aggressive styles in their cultures, they of course think that the blue stuff's soft and nice. Funny enough, it's actually tougher because it creates expectations of performance, it demands expectations, and so you saw on that drama, it's about producing a good outcome, which is what those constructive uh, styles are designed to produce. So as the morning progresses, you will see several illustrations at the individual and the organisational level of people learning to develop those constructive styles and the challenges that that produces for them, and yet the satisfaction that the outcomes from that achievement produces for them as well. So I know you're going to have a great morning. The speakers are fantastic. Enjoy yourself very much. Thank you.